Hello everyone, today's podcast conversation is with my dear friend and fellow artist Aaron Hupp. Aaron is a ceramic artist based in Oakland, California, and our conversation is very wide-ranging. We go into topics like collaboration, the nature of creativity, even mindset as an artist, and also we get into some of the business side of being a professional artist, like moving from a hobbyist to a professional artist as well as pricing your artwork. So we cover all kinds of topics. The conversation was so much fun and it was a real honor for me because she invited me into her sacred studio space. I got to paint a mural on the outside of her studio. She made me some gorgeous cups and bowls, an awesome art trade at the end of the day. And we got to film this awesome conversation that we had right in the middle of it all. So. Please enjoy this incredible conversation with artist Aaron Huff. How about we start uh, with you? Uh, maybe you can tell, uh, share with us a bit about yourself, your history, and um, your practice, who you are, and uh, what you're doing. Well, I'm currently focusing on making commission made to order ceramics for restaurants in the Bay Area, um, usually fine dining, coursed restaurants. And the way I do it is by collaborating with a chef. In fact, my whole practice is built about collaboration. So instead of a normal um, studio where I used to, where I learned ceramics, where you have um, plates that set sizes up on a website and then someone would go and order um, the array that they want, the idea and what inspires me the most about my practice is, is going to a space, meeting with a chef, um, seeing the food, eating the food, and then designing something with that chef specifically for that space. Um, and so that's sort of the the niche that I've fell into and I adore it. It's really, really fun. Yeah, uh, I mean, that <laughs> those few uh, seconds already give me so many ideas on questions and things <laughs> to ask you. Um, definitely some similarities between my work with like working with clients directly. Yes. Um, but how did you, maybe just to even go farther back, like how long have you been doing ceramics and uh, how did you kind of get into this uh, niche of uh, working with restaurants? So I've been, um, we call it throwing on the wheel. Um, it's like the etymology of ceramic words are so interesting. It's from an old English word called throw on. Um, so it actually means to turn. But um, I've been throwing on the wheel for Gosh, 22 years, maybe a little bit more. Um, so I started really young. I started in high school and I spent a lot of time in the art room um, when I was in my formative teenage years. So much so that the art teacher actually called my parents <laughs> and she's like, this is really great, but I'm just making, she want to make sure Erin has friends and that she's doing other, I mean, she has her art friends. There's like her and like two other guys that are in the art room every, every lunch. But um, it all sort of started there, and then my parents saw that I was really hooked and always provided an avenue or an access to a, a wheel. And then when I went to college, I worked at a production studio, and that's really when I learned wow. everything. Yeah. And I was I mostly self-taught. I took a few classes at the studio, and then I was hired as a production um, thrower. And that is completely, it is the opposite of what I'm doing right now because it's like you get an order in and let's say it's 30. I did beer steins for the Essen House for a little bit, which is a bar in Madison, mm -hmm. um, Wisconsin, which is where the production studio was and where I went to undergrad. And so you get a, a 30 stein order in and um, you have to make them look exactly the same. And if they don't, they get smushed and... There's a ruler out and everything's just so. And, you know, that kind of practice um, was really formative for me. It was great, you know, and just be, the repetition of learning something over and over again. Yeah. And learning the freedom of letting go, you know, make, creating something with your hands and then just watching either yourself or your boss just smash it right in front of your face. <laughs> like, and that's gone. It is wow. ephemeral. <laughs> Yeah. But um, Clay is a good teacher, and ceramic process is a good teacher. And so, anyway, so to answer your question, I started in production 
um, I really had a crossroads in undergrad of do I want to do a BFA or do I want to do a Bachelor's of Science, and I, po- I picked science. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always uh, took elective ceramics courses at UW-Madison and worked at the production studio, my yeah. undergrad. And then um, ended up going to law school wow. and diverting from the true path. <laughs> and then <laughs> five years ago, thought, well, why not go back to... Um, back to that decision point, that crossroads, yeah. and try the other thing. I mean, How long was that? Uh, that diversion? Yeah. Um, well, I went to, let's see. So I stopped production throwing in 2002. These are tough questions already, Strider. Um, <laughs> let me do math. I think, you know, the thing is, is, it's like, you ever look back and go, I never really diverted. I, every state I went into, I found a studio. Yeah, yeah. And I was always throwing. It I was, was going to ask if you were still yeah, in your practice yeah. the whole time. And it was just, it was hobby practice. I can't even tell you how many Christmas gifts my family got. And yeah. like right away they know it's like a heavy box. It's going to yeah. be ceramics. Yeah. And so I didn't really, I, and it's, I feel more like five years ago, I finally felt like I accomplished what I meant to accomplish to the extent that I could with my legal degree. I was helping foster children. It was really meaningful, worldly work. And I feel like a really good way to describe it is that I sort of woke up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute, there's this constant throughout my life as I've changed types of law, as I've changed intentions in my career, I've changed career paths, i become a mother, I had three kids. And the one constant, once I opened my eyes to see it, was always clay. Yeah. That got me through all of that. And so then why didn't I give clay a little bit more of my time and Mm -hmm. sort of see how that feels? Yeah. Well, what makes me um, kind of wonder even more about your time with your law degree was almost like, you know, what were there lessons, were there things that you learned during that time that, you know, they're very different avenues, but... um, in hindsight now, looking back, um, you know, was there anything that you kind of brought into your practice then, you know, like as comparison, like what the, at the beer stein place, like they were just like smashing it right in front of your face. You're like, whoa, okay. That's like real time (laughs) feedback. You know, I've had times, well, you know, in my career when it was like, I was working and then art was the hobby always. And then they start to get really close to the point that um, you know, my jobs were holding back my art and I could be yes. making more money doing my art. Oh, interesting. And so it was like this tipping of the scales, you know, people talk yeah. about. And it's like taking that leap. You're like, all right, now this is the focus. But yeah. it was in those other jobs and times that now I look like, oh, I learned so much that is actually I'm using all the time in my professional art career. And I'm just wondering if you have any, any uh, insight like, as you were saying that, um, I think I had a little bit of a different experience than you did, where I never had that point where I was like, well, clearly I could be making more money doing my art than because mm-hmm. lawyers, you know, are paid. Yeah. Even nonprofit, it was a pretty solid job. But um, I think my leap was much more of a leap, and then it just it worked yeah. out because of the niche that I went into that we can get into later. But I think... Gosh, I feel like, isn't that the whole point of life is like the journey and I've learned like to almost to distill how much I've learned. A few things flitted through my brain as you were talking. One, as you know, as a small business owner, and I think this is important for us to talk about um, and for people to hear that are interested in maybe going full time into art. You know, I've seen before, like, you know, out on social media, a pie of like what I spend my time doing as a small business Mm. owner and artist. And it's not just like 100% art. And so as a lawyer... I learned to read contracts. I'm entering in contracts all the time, mm-hmm. right? Um, really read fine print, think about details, think about partnerships, think about like stuff that I don't think my art brain had ever contemplated. Um, so I feel like that. And then, you know, law is tedious, and there are parts of the ceramic process that are tedious, mm-hmm. like any, yeah. you know, like constant cleaning up and recycling clay and just like a lot of patience and um, stick to itiveness. You don't get through law school and become a lawyer by just like sort of giving up. But I feel like, yeah, I mean, very obviously translatable skills are, you know, contracts and things like yeah. that. I, it almost makes me think too, like it was your baseline. It was your, your passion. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if there was like, you know, 
time that maybe the law was like seeming tedious and it was getting hard on you that when you did get to your wheel oh yeah you know like what you know times when i've had like you know when i was like juggling two jobs it was just like it almost refined my work my artwork because i didn't have as as much time yeah so like i got more precise and laser focused when I did hit the studio yes. because this other chunk of time was going to other, yes. you know, I worked in restaurants for years. And so serving and bartending, stuff like that. So it's like, I knew that like once I hit the studio, it was like much more yes. focused and I had my list of stuff to tackle. <laughs> I think that's such a wonderful insight. And I feel that in two different timelines, um, two different capacities, I feel that in the long extended timeline of my life, because I didn't choose the BFA route, and I, I almost like had this pent up, like overflowing. I have like journals and, and journals, ones over there of ideas, <laughs> right? That yeah. like I was too busy. I was being a lawyer. But then I also, that's like the, you know, I almost feel like for 15 years that artistic inspiration was mounting inside of me and I finally released it when I mm. decided to go all in. But then also on a smaller scale, I think this is also true of parenthood when time no longer becomes stretching out so, you know, your time isn't only for you all the oh, time, yeah. that when you do actually get into the studio, I feel like it's not that you weren't doing the art till you got into the studio. It's like all of the brain work behind my art and then I finally get there and I'm able to execute it, yeah. which is a completely different practice than when you're younger and you have a ton of time. And yeah. Um, so yeah, I feel that I get, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, my wife and I talk about that all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a two and a half year old and so we always just joke like, what were we doing before kid? Like, like you said it perfectly <laughs> just then you're just like, like time was open ended. Yeah. Like you could just, yeah. Go on vacation for a long week. Like, yeah, everything. Like, we could go to the movies. Like, mm -hmm. everything shifts. Yeah. Um, you have three kids. I have one. And it's just like... It's the same thing. We're feeling. like, oh, my God. Um, and we see, like, you know, young couples walking down the street. And we're like, you guys just doing whatever Do you, you want. <laughs> I mean, my husband and I had a really uh, great conversation about this, though. Because I remember we went into this, this mode for a while where we would, you know, wait hours for the best brunch place in San Francisco like it was just it was almost decadent and I remember um, my husband turning to me at one point and being like imagine this decadent use of time like until like for the rest of our lives and um I don't know if I can put it to words but sort of this feeling of like that's almost too much time in a way like like what are we doing what's our yeah. focus like besides our careers but yeah. yeah but kids definitely do make you prioritize I think and yeah a lot more efficient with time, for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's how we met, because um, your kids <laughs> went to, uh, when they were younger, went to my wife's uh, studio, the Rabbit Hole Children's Theater. So she introduced us. Yeah. Um, I think we were Instagram friends before anything. So, I think so, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, that's kind of what brought us into uh, our first project together, yes. which was with Flower and Water mm -hmm. uh, in early COVID, where we put together a little holiday kit. So I made a tabletop sculpture, you made a ceramic mug, and Flower and Water, the restaurant, put together a little pasta kit. Right. It was called the Gather Kit. So that was in early days of COVID, still very scary. Not every, like people were locked down. Locked down. We didn't know what was going on. But um, I think about that often because it was a very unique project in terms of me and you know someone who does mostly at that point murals and sculpt but getting into sculpture yeah um but working with a ceramic artist and a restaurant i know um you had a history with restaurants yeah um, but for me it was just really fun to think about you know different forms of uh, creative expression and um I, it was it was a very fun project to kind of tie these themes together mm -hmm. and and my wife had already bought a couple of mugs by you in the past so you were already in our cupboard <laughs> and That's I was awesome. I was very excited to kind of work with you and talk about how we can bring ideas together and through diff both of our different practices but mm -hmm. um, yeah the only time I've really worked with a restaurant I have painted some restaurants but like working with a restaurant yeah. um, I'm wondering if you could share a bit more about how you kind of got into that area for yourself and um, what that's been like, you know, as compared to just 
a passion during your law practice. Um, it's a very interesting uh, niche, and yeah. we've talked about it. I was like, let's save it for the podcast because <laughs> we started. We just start getting like, into it. I'm like, oh, pump the brakes. Yeah. Um, so I I have lots of questions about that so maybe you can just bring us into that yeah. space yourself well i'm so excited you brought the gather concept of our bundle that we did with flower and water um up because i feel like that's one of the reasons i wanted to work with restaurants is what is a meaningful act that people do we all gather around a table remember that we came up with all of this great this great theory and messaging in our bundle and it's funny because it, it spoke so much to me when we put that together um, because it's one of the reasons I was excited about doing restaurants. Um, you know, that time, especially a course meal, that it's usually a special occasion. It's a moment that people, for, in fine dining, that people slow down and they really focus on flavors and company and the people that they're dining with. And... It's a time that my husband and I would save up for and enjoy these dinners out. And it was, you know, it's not just, you know, eat for sustenance and go. It's, it was gathering around a table. And one of the things I love about working with restaurants is that um, unlike art that I do on my own, like a vase, I mean, there's flowers in it. But when I'm making plates, they become a canvas for somebody else's art, right? Mm-hmm. So... I am picturing not just what the plate is going to look like in itself, but what the plate could look like and how it would best sort of uphold the chef's food art, right? Um, how it can be flexible to many different iterations, different menus that change every you know month or two, seasonal menus, how it's going to look in the space. And the thought of being part of this time where I'm working with another artist, the artist being the chef, to, co- to co-create and co like collaborate on something really beautiful, but then also the setting that you're in. It's like a live gallery, right? It's interactive. People, Mm -hmm. I really hope people like pick up the plates and, or I work a lot with textures so that people run their fingers over and it's part, it becomes part of the conversation. Maybe something catches their eye and they slow down and it's part of that gather concept, which is why I loved our holiday bundle so much. It was the whole messaging on that was really meaningful to me, but, um, yeah. But that's one of the reasons I went because of the experience I had at restaurants and what it meant to me and the idea of being super specific with another artist and in a way, a little bit of a surrender, like you make your piece mm-hmm. and then it's not just done. You're going to give it to somebody else and the relationships that I build there and working with just amazing chefs, knowing that they're going to, their art is going to come together and create like this whole new art piece and then it'll change every monthly menu. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I've, I've thought a lot about since, since our project and, um, it just made me much more aware of, uh, ceramics in restaurants, you know, I haven't been out as much to restaurants <laughs> these days, but the few that I have, I really take note. And that's something that we've kind of talked about before in passing is, you know, you have this really interesting line between pure art and also uh, like, I don't want to use like utilitarian, but like it's practical, you know, it's used. And you're saying like, absolutely by another artist being the chef. Yeah. And so it's just, I was thinking about that after you said that once, um, I was like, oh my God, I really don't know another, I couldn't think of one off the top of my head, another creative practice where where it is like you you are stretching the canvas so to speak and then that is your art form and then it gets it leaves your studio it leaves your presence and then it has a whole nother life of its own the work out there in the field and that's just like so fascinating to think about and as you're saying that too it also makes me think about the chef being an artist and um you know you're providing this uh, dish for them to present their food on and I think about you know seasonally how menus change and things yeah. and so it's like I'm wondering what process you have working with a chef and how like I don't know like maybe some like questions or things that surprised you maybe the first couple of times or things that informed your practice yeah uh that were like you know for me I'm just thinking like as a chef well here are my plates I, I know I'm gonna create you know a year's worth of different stuff on this. Yes. So like what 
questions do you get from chefs thinking about, you know, like how much life they're going to get out of your art? Yeah, no, <laughs> there's that's a lot a, in there. But there is a lot in there, but these are good questions. So, um, oftentimes, so I am never brought onto the scene to make a whole, you know, it's just me. I'm a single uh, business woman and I'm the only one throwing the art. So I'm never going to make a bunch of plates. So your question is really relevant, right? Because if they want to get the most use out of the special plate that we've collaborated on, um, how versatile can it be? Yeah. And I think one of, I've thought about this a little bit. I think one of the things that I've been really lucky um, with in my career is I've worked with chefs that have had enough experience that I think they at least know a size of plate for their cooking that yeah. can be versatile, right? Um, other things are like, where where is the focus of the design? So a lot of my texture, any color I put on is always off-centered and on the side, mm. which provides like a good, um, you know, are they going to line up? In a tasting menu, the food isn't going to heap over and fill up the whole plate. Are they going to line it up on that bias cut like texture? Are they going to cut into it at an angle? Um, so we definitely talk a lot and I've asked chefs a lot about how are you going to use this. Yeah. So like, for example, when I first started working with California, which was my second restaurant, um, and I still work with Val, Chef Val Cantu all the time, is he said, I need a taco plate. And when the people pick up, you know, you take your hands and you pick up the tortilla, I want a surprise there somehow mm. on the ceramics. And I'm like, we, we, <laughs> we met so many times. He is so much fun to collaborate with. And we ended up, it's really simple, but there is like a concentric circle that you wouldn't see when the taco is laid out and the, his homemade blue corn tortilla is all flat. And when you pick it up, it's a little bit of like a texture and a color change, right? right. That sort of, um, but then I've later seen him use those plates for other things where you can see the full design of the plate for something that's small and really tight. Yeah. Um, I think part of my answer is that the chef's, that I work with have experience. They're they're artistic in themselves, so they're gonna you know, they're gonna experiment with the plates that they that they get. And nothing that we're doing is so restrictive that the chef wouldn't be able to figure out another way to use yeah. it. Really, there's nothing that's like you know, it's only a penny big, and the, you know, like only this one thing will fit on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I think the other fun thing, maybe sort of tucked in one of your questions that I always love talking about with my work is um, when you have two different artists, it could be any mediums, right? It could be like a fiber artist working with a wood artist. Um, we have me, a ceramic artist, working with someone that works with food. There are no um, questions that are, are, you know, deemed silly or stupid mm -hmm. because we are working in completely different careers. And so that opens up a freeing, like, uh, open attitude where we just ask each other really it's like so much fun like and just all these nerdy questions like what do you do then with the oven and like how you know are you putting just you need to know all of these little ways that your ceramics are being used and so so i have this it, you know and then similarly the chefs ask me things that a ceramicist would never ask me to do right like well can you just do this no that'll blow up in the kiln like you yeah. know but but with those questions come um, opportunities for me to be a little bit more daring with my practice. I think we get siloed or wh whether we try to be really open-minded or not, we can get siloed in our practice. Like, ceramic, like So one time Val was like, I like this black. We had a couple different shades of black and I like this black, but I really just want something in the middle. Can you just like mix the glazes together? As a ceramicist, I was like, well, no, I just start with a new recipe and make a whole new glaze. I wouldn't necessarily mix these glazes together. And then I got back to my studio and I was like, oh, you sound like an old crotchety man. Like, get <laughs> off my lawn. We don't do that. And so I did it. And that is the black that I use really? all the time. It has this uh. beautiful blue undertone. So I don't know that I'm being so eloquent, but it's that, that freeing of your mind of being open to suggestion, even when you think like, that's not really done or, yeah. and, and that is such a beautiful place to be. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it makes me think, um, my wife being, uh, in theater, um, I've never done improv, but I know that it is a, a rule of improv that there's no no's. Yes. It's yes. Yes. And, and. <laughs> yes. and I like, 
think about that all the time. So do I. And it just like, it also brings to mind like another quote from someone somewhere, but um, something along the lines of, I'm, I'm not so interested in people who just give answers. I'm interested in people who ask questions, questions. I love because that. questions are open ended and that ultimately drives creativity. And so when you're working with another creative of any capacity, especially another field or industry yeah. or, you know, genre like that you're describing, um, if you, if both sides can understand that, then the dance continues. And yes. that's often where like breakthroughs and innovation happen, possibly for both of you. Yes. And, um, you know, I've got some opportunities in my career to do that. Um, but no, I've never worked like closely like you, your relationship with chefs um, sounds very deep and, um, you know, long term as well. And, yeah. and I, I've come into projects with like big mural installations and things where, you know, I'll work with uh, the end client, a designer, maybe an architect. And we talk a little bit, you know, for a month or two, but never like to this degree. And yeah. it just makes me think of... Uh, we should probably collaborate again real soon. I know, I know. Well, well, this is the next thing. I mean, I, I basically, yeah, we need to do it again. Yeah. I love the, the yes and. I often think about this with parenting, too, is um, it's sort of what we want as parents, too, is to hear our children say, you know, like, well, you know, let's, let's, Let's go do let's go do a hike. Yes, and let's bring a picnic. That's a great idea. Yeah. But um, I think there is this this freedom of having that perspective. And as you we talk about this, I'm thinking, is that just the luck of the draw that I met these amazing chefs that have that are predisposed to that attitude already? Is it a unspoken, it was definitely not spoken, this unspoken um, mutual respect of art form where, you know, I'm working with chefs. I can't even tell you how much I respect these chefs because they are working in a really tough industry. They're incredibly creative and they make magic. And so I think the minute you come to come to the table with someone like that, like how much I respect you and you respect me when we would collaborate together, it's almost... Maybe that's just the magic that creates that kind of atmosphere. The yes and yeah. the the I'm not going to say no right away. I'm going to think about it. Maybe someone. Maybe you have a point, and maybe I can um, sort of launch off of that idea into another one. Yeah. Well, I think it takes like uh, you know the uh, it takes a certain kind of humility for someone to like you said with the glaze like to be able to come back. Well, you know what? Maybe I should question this. Like, what if? Yeah. Like I know my maybe speaking for your ceramic teacher back in the day, but like, no, that is against tradition. We do not like, you know, Yeah. but it worked and it, yeah. it like changed a lot for you. It changed and a ton for me. So that takes, you know, some capacity for you to be able to go back to the drawing board and just be like, question everything, you yeah. know? And, and I think, you know, working with, I think you draw those chefs to you because you present yourself and, and now you have the portfolio, mm -hmm. you know, of working with such people that you're, you're drawing them and, and people can see that you are very serious about this and it is a major passion of yours. Yeah. And I think that's just going to weed out, you know, like, and, and I think you would like see red flags with yes. anyone that you're just like, no, you know, like <laughs> this, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've experienced, you know, stuff like that. Then it just comes from time, you know, yeah. just when you start to talk with somebody like, ooh, this could be... This might not work. I'm going to shut this down right now or like... Or maybe uh, yes and later Yeah. <laughs> when things change. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I think that, I think the way that you put this out there and how you communicate that on your social and on your website and stuff, it's very clear. And so... So I think that you have absolutely drawn the right people to you. Um, it did make me think too when you were talking about pre kids mm -hmm. and going to restaurants. Yeah, you were still doing this as your passion. Um, did you always say like I would love to throw plates for a restaurant someday? Was that like intentional? Was that in your mind? Yeah, and I think it's a really like so there is a couple layers to that question so it there are things that we say 
reflexively and don't really think about it. And I think it was in that level, right? Where I'm out and I'm having a glass of wine and I'll, you know, my friends and my husband would always like count down like Aaron's finished the plate in five, four, three, she's going to pick it up. She's going to look at it. You know, like I, like they would count down like five, four, three, two, one. And I had the plate up and I, I really hope, um, people listening here are inspired to do that about every aspect of a dining experience because it's all chosen. It's a choice, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And at certain restaurants, the cutlery is a choice. The, the glass blower is a choice. The napkins, everything. And so it's the mural. Exactly. Right. Like how does that make me feel while I'm sitting here and my dining partner has gone to the restroom and I'm staring at this mural and you know, um, but I don't think that I took myself seriously enough at the time, you know, or I got into the, um, the, the self-talk of like, I'm a, I'm a lawyer or boy, I went through that. I did like an accelerated program where you take four years and condense it into three. So I got, I had received both a master's and a law and boy, that, that was a lot of work. And I, I did that time and therefore I am going to be an attorney because, and so yes, I would go out to dinner and I'd say, boy, wouldn't, like offhandedly, flippantly, wouldn't it be awesome to make these ceramics? Like, what, I would love to do that someday. But never in my wildest imagination did I actually really picture myself doing that and really think of it as anything other than a flippant dream, if that makes any sense. And I think it's interesting to reflect upon that and to think about things in your life that if you gave a little bit of room or a little bit of space or a little bit of sincerity to like what would happen? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but here I am now and I'm honestly living my best life. I have never been so happy. I felt fulfilled as an attorney. I did really meaningful work, but I feel like I came home to me with this career shift Mm. and found myself again. And that is such an authentic, deep feeling. Um, that I, I hope, I wish everyone could experience. It's, yeah. It's really meaningful. Yeah. Uh, I have so much, so much uh, resonance there with the things you were saying. Um, you know, the last few years for me have been a pretty major spiritual shift in myself. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a pretty atheist household. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom raised us at a Unitarian Universalist church, which was amazing because... Sunday school for me was just learning about world religions and Mm -hmm. everyone was accepted and you could practice whatever you wanted. It was just a community of people. Um, And I just kind of grew up in that learning and just, I was like, wow, all right, there's lots of different ways to experience life. And yes, and and yes, and, (laughs) Uh, but I still like held just this pretty stringent, you know, kind of atheist view, which is like, we're on a rock floating through space, but The last several years, I've really been going deeper and deeper into the magic, for lack of a better term, of things that are unquantifiable, that cannot be documented with the tools that we currently have. And um, with that, there's just some major realizations, and a lot of it, the last two years, has really been very being very conscious of the words that I use both in my mind to myself and what I put out. And I've heard this is what all the great teachers tell us. Like the words are very powerful. They literally shape your world, Mm -hmm. how you experience it. And I believe what comes to you as well. And it just made me think so much about what you were saying, you know, like maybe at the time you weren't thinking like, Oh, I'm going to do this. Like I'm getting ready. I'm going to do it next month or next year. But even just like, having that thought or saying it out loud, it's starting to create some momentum. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, we all, most people do that. But like you were saying, like, kind of like, what if you gave it a little more? Like, what if you just kept with that dream? You know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's maybe Mm -hmm. won't happen in a year. But like, this momentum really does start to build. And just for myself, I mean, some big changes in my practice and my career over the last few years. And I just like keep seeing the correlations with truly like the words that I'm using. And I mean, I'm I'm a self-taught artist. I went through grad school studying cultural anthropology. Um, So there it was like, 
wow, there are so many different ways to experience this show. And um, that was endlessly, you know, just fascinating to me. But that's where I really got to see, you know, different cultures, um, many of which are, you know, just from linguistic anthropology. It is like absolutely true that the words that we use shape our reality. Um, One of the best examples, I don't know if you've seen that movie Arrival, that sci-fi. I love that movie. I've watched it like like three times. Like the circular time. And then it's like, oh, their language is not linear. I was like... Yes, yes. <laughs> this is the best. Um, Every time I watch that movie, I get more out of it. I actually watched uh, it with my 12-year-old the other day. Oh, cool. And she was like, there was that moment. And isn't it fun when, when you see your children, sort of that aha moment where she was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, yeah. yeah but yes. Yeah. Um, but your pers- yeah, you were, I don't, there's so much in what you just said that I read that resonates with me is this. You know, like oftentimes I tell this story, you know, so you give, you give this, you give a little space to what you said. So let's say I I was at dining at a restaurant and I said, oh, wouldn't it be fun? Flippantly, like I said. And then two years later, um, I've come to a crossroads. I just had my third child and, and the firm I was working at calls me and says, are you coming back? And it's like, a cliff, right? Whoa. And everything in my responsible body, but like bone, you know, being is like, I'm going to use the law degree I worked so hard on. I'm still, I'm still, you know, practicing. I'm still barred. I'm licensed. What would it be to just, right? Yeah. So you give it a little bit of space. But even then, in that first year, I don't know if this happened to you. People are like, what are you doing? And it's not like I go, well, I'm an artist. It was like this. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing. So you give a little bit of space and then, then you fill that space and then you give a little bit more. And the more I accepted the path that I was doing, the more I talked about it, the more I talked to myself about it. And the more I said to people, I'm an artist now. Yeah. I'm going to choose to follow my art. I'm doing my art full time. You know, the more that became my reality. Yeah. Right. So I, re- that really resonates with yeah. me that, um, I used to go, I had this wonderful yoga teacher through all three of my pregnancies um, in San Francisco, and we always ended up the class saying, remember, um, right intention, right thought, right speak, um, right mind, or something like that. And it was just like this reminder of everything you think, everything you say, everything you intend should be in, lo- in alignment of the world you want to see, yeah. right? And yeah. thinking, it, so that resonates a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it was the same exact thing for me when I was um, just moving from, you know, part-time work to going art full-time. I, I was completely unaware of how I was talking about it. People were like, what do you do? Oh, yeah. You're like, well, I'm, you know, like I, I yeah. paint some murals, but, you know, I'm also like bartend a little bit. And like, it took yeah. my wife, you know, girlfriend at the time, Brooke, she was like, Strider, put your flag in the ground and declare yourself an artist because yes. you are. And for some reason, like, it probably took me, like, a year or more oh, to, yeah. like, really do that with, like, sincerity and authenticity. And yeah. that is just, like, so fascinating. And, um, I mean, even, like, right now, like, I'm just trying to do some, like, real big, like, subconscious work uh, yeah. with my therapist. Just, like, really getting into, like, these deep meditative states and, like, going deep. And because what I'm understanding is, like... You know, we're talking about being conscious, which is like number. It's hard enough to be like start to notice those things, and it, yes. it's great when you have someone that can bounce that off of you, like a partner or someone Absolutely. that's like, you're an artist. Like, say it. Yeah. Um, now I'm like trying to even go like deeper, which is like stuff that I'm not conscious of at all. But these ways that we ultimately are crafting like the stories of our lives, right. which can go like way back to like childhood and stuff. Oh, yeah. But but it's so true and. And so, like, these these words that we use are just fundamental. And that's something, you know, I talk with a lot of, you know, uh, hobbyist artists that are wanting to go professional full-time or even, like, have, you know, done some classes with college students and given, mm-hmm. like, some seminars and stuff. And this is, like, ultimately the main thing that I tell everyone. Like, I barely talk about an art practice. I'm like, yeah. really, it's, like, mindset. Yep. Your mindset determines everything. Art 
family, partners, yeah. like everything. But art is under that as well. So it's just something that's really come been coming clear to me the last several years and and something I'm just like super fascinated with. And I'm glad to hear that you say that your share your story of how you were saying these things at first, which started to like get the snowball probably rolling. So I'm wondering how you got your first restaurant client. Oh, with oh, all that, you've yeah. been going to restaurants, you're turning over plates, yeah. you're looking at it, you're saying it, you have your practice. How did that first one come to be? And I, I well, so it's interesting because I, I really stumbled into it. So, it, you know, that classic hindsight is twenty twenty, And like I said, when I decided even just going down the art path, I felt like I woke up a little bit like Aaron. There is, there is this thing that has been your constant your whole life since you were 17, and why don't you just spend a little bit more time and focus and energy doing it, right? So similar thing happened where I, wo- I feel like I've woken up to my art practice and stages. So my first year, I was like, I'm just going to throw mugs. They sell pretty easily. I'm just so happy to be on the wheel this much. I'm just going to do mugs. And so I was in coffee shops, and I was at little stores, um, rare device, rare device. So I was making mugs and, um, really just had my sights only on mugs. And, you know, Instagram is so funny like this. Someone reached out to me and said, Hey, I'm this curator and I want to host a party and we'll be doing three beverage pairings with your, with your tumblers. And I just, I, I would really love that to be part of the experience. And I remember thinking, this is so random. I've never done anything like this. And it was a moment where I was like, and that is why I'm going to say yes. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, yes, and and let's try this and let's do it. And so I showed up and the the private party booking was like for a private room. And it was in this restaurant, which unfortunately has closed since then because of the pandemic, named Onsen. And it had a Japanese bath house in the back and this adorable, like maybe six table restaurant in the front oh, wow. and a private dining room and then massage rooms. And so we were in the private dining room and I spent the night with many other creatives, maybe like a couple influencers and this curator who then later went on to work for a bearish hotels. Um, and we've kept in touch, uh, this woman and I, but it was a room full of like just high energy, creative people. And cool. we were all you know, enjoying the tumblers. And I, and even in that moment, I wasn't really like thinking through what this was like mm. me experiencing my art live in a restaurant setting. Yeah. And we had a couple rounds of wine and I was, you know, packing up my crates of ceramics and leaving. And the owner of the restaurant, Carolyn came over and she said, Hey, did you notice how great this looked in our space? Like your art. And I was like, Oh, it did look pretty good. <laughs> like I really enjoyed that. And it's just like, it's you know, and, and she's like, and I gave her my business card and I went home and it just clicked. And I thought that night meant so much to me. I watched people gathering, right? Everything that we've talked about, I watched them enjoying the pieces. I, you know, I enjoyed the pieces in a public setting. Um, I gathered so much inspiration about the room and the setting and the food. And and that was my first restaurant. It was Onsen. And I worked with a chef there named George Mesa. And he's over at um, Viridian in Oakland right now, Mm. which is so good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and that gave me, I feel like, the, the foundation. And you were talking about Brooke. So, you know, your wife. And so through each step, you know, of this, I'd come home as we do with our partners and I'd report to my husband, Adam, and he's like, and he's just always a <clears throat> pushing the envelope kind of guy. And he is, he said to me, this is amazing. This is great. You know, like do Onsen see, and then Onsen went really well. And he's like, all right, think big. Like, where would you want to go? What's your favorite restaurant in San Francisco? And I was like, well, that's easy. It's like California's or Rich Table. Because at that time, we, we didn't have a ton of money, and we hadn't been to a bunch of places. But the pla- of the places, the subset that I had enjoyed in San Francisco, those two really spoke to me. And um, and Adam goes, we'll just reach out to them. And I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, we're talking about like Michelin-starred restaurants. Are you crazy? And it was this moment 
again, where I'm like, no, I've done this. You know, and break those cycles, everything we're talking about in our head Mm -hmm. that I'm still telling myself I'm a lawyer taking a break for a hobby. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) no, I have a restaurant client. Right. And I reached I cold called. I just like reached out to Val Cantu. And I think it took him a while to respond. I think almost like three or four weeks of which I was like, oh, is that a bad idea? And I'm like, well, the worst worst case scenario is he just doesn't respond. Um, And he did. And we met and it, it was. Like, boom, we've got, we've got, like, he took a chance on me. We really gelled. We built off of each other. It's like the conversation that you and I are having, right? Mm -hmm. Where you meet someone and it's like, yeah, and this, and then this, and then this. And we just kept on going. And I never looked back. And so that's how I started out. In this moment of, gosh, there's all these threads that we're talking about. Telling yourself that you can do something. Mm -hmm. Believing in yourself. Breaking these cycles, maybe even um, subconscious ones, of these narratives that we tell ourselves and the foundation of who we decide we are um, and just breaking it all down. It's like just breaking it all down so you can build it up in a different, more positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's just... There's so much uh, that we as creatives want want to do, and I talk a lot about this, you know, with other artists, friends of mine, and, and those being mainly painters. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like we, I talk to some friends, and they are very adamant. They're like, I don't, I don't have like a five year plan. But then I talk to some others that very much do, and I, I'm the one that like does. Uh And I'm always curious to see kind of where people are at, people that are doing this like as a business. Um, And and like now that I've been doing this work and I'm much more conscious of the words that I'm using, how I'm talking about myself uh, outside and inside, Mm -hmm. you know, I can really see, you know, where people are at. And, you know, maybe even some people that I know that are so talented, like so talented and they're using some words that I think are just holding them back like yes. immensely. And I'm trying to be a sounding board for them, but also, you know, like you can't push someone into change. Like people are gonna change when they're ready. Yes. But I I always think about, you know, someone like you had your partner at the time, I had my partner at the time, people that are pushing us to yes. be like, where would you right. what would be your wildest dream? Like yeah. imagine that. And the more spiritual I am getting and getting into like quantum physics and stuff, I'm like, we live in infinite potential. And that meaning almost any narrative, I believe, can unfold. And that can happen individually and also collectively. And it's all these like narratives that are coming together for the collective. But it makes me... It makes me think of, you know, like we, we are creators, we are bringing ideas into physical form into the world. And that's just like such an interesting practice, um, a way of being and one like side massive side tangent, one that I fundamentally believe all humans are because you see kids and they're just creating yeah every like no kid comes out being like no i don't want those crayons (laughs) like so we lose that Mm -hmm. as we get older unfortunately and i believe that it's culturally done there are some cultures that foster that more and blah 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 that's a huge that's the next podcast (laughs) anthropological (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) that's another four-hour conversation there but but i i have friends i have acquaintances and talk with people online and in classes and things and Um, Again, just coming back to like the words and believing what is possible. Um, But I I believe that everything exists as potential. And so it's about like creating the right like energy. And Mm -hmm. that can be in your mind, how you're talking about it, someone else talking about you. But like there's this field around us that can like pretty much attract, I believe. Uh, Very different from what I would have said 10 years ago. I know. (laughs) But too many incredible things have happened for it to be not true to me now. Like, I can't look back now because I've lived it. And and so now I'm 
I, I've gone through a big shift in myself over the last, you know, five years moving from mostly mural painting to sculptural work. And that's like a completely new area for me, one that is like so exciting. Mm -hmm. But also I am running into places where I'm just like, I'm kind of like starting yes. from, not from scratch, but you know, it's a, it's a totally different world. And so I'm like, kind of like, I'm, that's why I'm happy I'm doing this like work with myself now. Cause I'm like, no strider, like what is your biggest dream? Yes. And my wife Brooks there to always like push me even further, which is so incredible. Um, whoever's listening to this, like if you have a partner, they yeah. make sure they're pushing you because we, we can hold ourselves back. Yes, you can hold yourselves back. And then I also think a lot about like how do we as artists, wherever we are, there will always be people that are coming up, you know, and needing some help and how do you extend your hand and as you're talking, I was thinking about how both um, Brooke and Adam, our partners, were were asking, you know, Adam was asking me questions. Like, but what do you, it wasn't that he was telling me what to do. Like, you know, I think you should. And it's, it's accessing that thought pattern about yourself, that self-reflection. Yeah. And um, being there for others as they come up in that same way. So even if you don't have a partner, you know, I have so many relationships, like our relationship, um, other artist relationships where it's, it's just that open minded, like, where can you go with this? What are the infinite possibilities? Yeah. And which one do you want to sort of, I think of like a little pluck that little thread, right? And then yeah. follow it along. Yeah. Um, it made me think as you were just uh, talking there, I definitely like, in terms of, you know, hopefully inspiring some other people if they're not following their passion uh, to do so. <laughs> but, yeah. but did you ever have um, someone, another ceramic artist, like you, you trained at a production yeah. shop, but did you, I don't know, ever have someone that was like at a higher level than you, like mentor or at least someone to be able to like talk with about this yeah. that helped you in, in any way? I feel like, so back then, the odd answer, well, my, it was no one, it wasn't anyone that was ahead of me on the track because I didn't have a track. I didn't know where I was going. I actually sort of just knew where I wasn't going. And I looked at the production studio and what I had been working in for three or four years and decided that wasn't my life. But I didn't think beyond that possibility to things like what I'm doing now with my art. It was actually a a group of us and definitely one of my really good friends that was my same age we would just like get a six pack of beer and meet at the studio and it was that open-ended um, self-teaching and being with another fellow basic beginner and just not caring if things get bad you know yeah. like like things would just <laughs> fall and we would laugh I mean the, the, like the beer or two that we had helped with that you know but like <laughs> just not being afraid to fail basically yeah is probably a better it it's not a mentorship but it was a community building a community of of um anything goes and let's just see and and honestly like i say this a lot and i really deeply mean it clay was my teacher like the ceramic process requires you to have patience it even people that have been doing this for like decades and decades still when they peek open that kiln they're not quite sure if it worked out you know yeah. and it's like it's this process that you, there's a surrender about it. And the process itself was my mentor and my teacher at that time. But in the last five years, I've definitely stumbled across artists such as, you know, you and other people that, that are a little bit further in their practice that are 100% like solid mentors on, you know, where, what do I want to be doing? Even if, and none of the, actually two that I'm thinking of, one is a fiber artist. She's not even a ceramicist. Yeah. And, but the outlook, the intention with the practice, um, what she's trying to achieve, I find incredibly inspiring. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, it's such a big thing for artists um, because, you know, depending on the creative practice, uh, we're by ourselves a lot. A lot. Yes. And so community, you know, those nights with your friends, having some beers, throwing some yes. pots, you know, it's like, I think it's so important and something that gets like overlooked, yeah. um, because it's just easy just to get slipping into that. Oh yeah. Um, 
you know, it makes me think, like, I heard this a while ago um, in regards to, like, martial arts training, but uh, who I forget who it was that said this, but you should practice with people that are better with you at your same level and uh, that are lower than you. Yeah. You should work with all three. And you'll be learning a lot by the, the master. And then you'll be, like, pushing yourselves, so like, giving it everything yes. you have with your peers. Yes. And then you're passing along what you've learned the, thus far to the up-and-comers, to the new people. And I think about that, like, a lot. And I was really fortunate when I moved to San Francisco in 2012. I uh, landed in working at this great street art and graffiti gallery, 1 a.m., uh, downtown. And that was... Um, just fundamental for me because I was I was already into street art and uh, murals but you know definitely not at a professional level yet but I, it was the first time I was like meeting and interacting with professional artists and I got to meet like all the Bay Area like incredible muralists mm-hmm. and graffiti and street artists at that time and I got to pick a lot of their brains you know they're just like they're coming in to drop off art. I got to meet with them. And I started, I made some of my best friendships from that. But ultimately people that were further along than me. And I was just, I mean, maybe it's the, maybe it's the community. Maybe it's the location. Maybe it's the genre. I don't know. But everyone was incredibly open mm-hmm. and sharing with like how they got to be where they are. I mean, even like numbers that they're using, financials and stuff, they're just like very open. I was like, oh my God, this is like incredible. And I got to see, you're like, oh wow, these guys all have business cards. Like, okay. And they all have websites (laughs) and they have contracts that they use and they have pitch decks that they use. I was like, I started to see, you know, success leaves clues. And so I started, I was so lucky to have had that, that, I mean, that skyrocketed my going from a hobbyist to a professional and you know talking with some other artists it's not I just like it's not always the same I feel like and a lot of people are very guarded with uh, their knowledge and but you know no shaming anyone but I I just and I just don't want to live in a world where creativity is a zero-sum game I believe it's absolutely not it's infinite And the only way more better will come is if we open up and we talk and we support and we ask questions with each other um, to tie a few threads of our conversation thus far. But um, as you're talking about it, you're making me think of another example I can give, which is ever since. So in the last two years, which should be the most isolating of my art practice in theory, right, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, I feel that people are learning and maybe being more and more open and I've connected with this really rad crew of East Bay uh, female ceramicists that are exact when you were describing how like the reception that you felt you had of the graffiti and muralists when you first started working at that gallery that is how I feel here so I know this is just coming over the bay and relocating here but it's a whole new set of, oh, yeah. of ceramicists in, in Oakland area versus who I was hanging out with and throwing in San Francisco and I am just blown away by it. We are, you know, if I get an order, I firmly believe in what you're saying. And and since I'm only one person and I'm not a studio and I don't have a team, there are times where I receive orders that I simply just numerically cannot fill. Even if yeah. I'm excited about the restaurant, even if I'm excited about the the concept. And I will give it to someone like Sarah Kirsten, who does have a studio in Oakland. And um, I started doing this over and over again. Instead of just being like, no, right? I'm thinking, how can I foster, this chef has already gone out of their way, I'm not on a lot of radars, to find somebody that's local, that's an independent ceramicist, that's doing handmade, thoughtful, intentional intentional work. How can I get them into a yes and category, yeah. right? So like, I've referred, you know, referred out to other, and, and it just started, it caught like wildfire. Um, in fact, all, we're all getting together to do a, a pit firing tomorrow. Cool. on the beach where who could theoretically be my competitors like other artists you know with the wrong frame of mind um with a closed mind a competitive mind a guarded secret mind but we all work together we refer 
jobs to each other and it's just such a beautiful space to be and and we create together and now we're all going to get together and do like just this really wonderful community event and um I agree with you I think that only good can come from that kind of sharing of prices and practices Mm -hmm. and ideas and inspirations and yeah well with the pricing too it's like you know I understand that's that's a very vulnerable thing at first but also I someone like was talking with this with a friend and they were saying well that if we're more open with our pricing with each other then we'll all ultimately get paid better because right now people are like undercutting yeah then it's just a race to the bottom it is a race yes and so it's like who can do it cheaper and it's like oh man like that's no way like we're all losing then because yes. now the clients think that it should be cheaper and cheaper, exactly. and cheaper and now people are working harder and longer and making less of a return oh yeah where so like the way that that was shared with me i was like oh my god like light bulb moment and so, yeah, that's something I absolutely love to just openly pass on to oh, people. I think it's so important. I mean, I have the my oldest clay friend in the Bay Area. Um, we've known each other since the first community studio that I joined when I first moved here. Gosh, it must have been 2010, maybe 2009, a long time ago. And we, we actually, we have this promise where... I'll pick up the phone. I'll be like, hey, what's up? And, sh- and she'll be like, okay, I, I think I have a new client. And I'm like, what are you going to make for them? And she's like, you know, roughly seven inch bowls, da 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 da. Is there hand carving involved? Is there this? How much are you charging? And then the answer to each of us, to each other, always is, are you sure that's enough? Like, is that really accounting for the time? Yeah. You said hand carving. And it's just a lot of questions yeah. and support. Like, yeah. Are you sure? Are you sure you want to pay? You know, and it's ultimately her decision, but just being that sounding board of like, and then offering, well, actually, you know, with the level of work that you're talking about, so maybe those are like my ink texture bowls and they're five inches. I roughly charge this range and maybe like, you know, she's been $505 per item under that range. And then we have a conversation about it and like trying to capture that time and that effort and then just normalizing the market of like and even then i'm not sure that artists do have all of their time and intention captured even even if we're pushing each other and helping each other to gain what we a closer to realistic yeah um price for our time but but i think that's what we should all be doing it's just asking questions of each other are you sure that accounted for all the time that you spent doing that mural yeah, writer. totally. Um, that's something, those are like just some like business practices that I've learned from just business books, not even art yeah. related, but really trying to understand where all your time and effort goes in. And so like for me, you know, like I've, I'm now at a place where I'm calculating, um, you know, meetings, yes. site visits, design time, yes. travel, Yes. Like everything is broken down and at first, you know, that number starts to go up and I, at first I oh, feel yeah. like this, oh no, it. like I'm <laughs> going to lose it, but I'm going to lose the project, but, right. but that's what it takes. And like, I feel like art, like I, I know like a lot of creatives and artists have this like thing where they do, they just like want to get the job and depending on where you're at in your career, like, yeah, right. I mean, like I There's did cheap work, Me like too. you got to get the portfolio up. But at some point, you really should be respectful of your time and how many years you put into this, too, you know? Yes. And it's like, you're a master. And so what would a master be paid for this? And if you lose the client, then, like, so be it. There's more where that came from. Yep. And then the right client will come and you'll get that relationship and then you'll create great work, like, and then that'll be on your portfolio and that client will be on your list and all of a sudden more clients, like bigger yes. clients will come. Like we were talking earlier with like working with like really incredible chefs. It's like you're gonna you're at a certain point where like the not so desirable ones probably are like weaning themselves out because yes. of the caliber of work that you're doing and the caliber of people you're working with. And for me, really understanding all the time and effort that goes into it. And definitely it was my wife, Brooke, that really helped me see that. She's like, I th- like here's how many hours you've just said are going to go into this project. Yes. Like, and here's what you like budgeted. And, you know, like 
at first, like, I didn't like the idea of breaking stuff down into an hourly rate. I really fought that for I a while. I fought it. I fought it so hard. It's and now I You've really love it because it's just like some quantifiable number just to use as a baseline. Right. And I'll give like a different price for like design time versus installation. And because me at my iPad designing is one thing, but like, you know, the installation is another. Um, but yeah, I think, I think for artists, like there's just, there's such a frantic yes to like needing the job. But also, like, another friend of mine, Cameron, said this to me once, where he's like, Strider, if you say no, or if you say yes to a low price, yes. then you're pinning yourself that's there, yep. and that's all the client is ever going to think you, and they're going to try to get it down more. And because it's, uh, and especially working with, like, big companies, like, mm-hmm. I've worked with, like, massive companies, like, you know, Google and stuff, and, um, you know, at, at everyone, there's so much job is just to get stuff done for as cheap as possible. Exactly. That's just business. Yes. It's, they're not... They're not taking it personally. They're not trying yeah. to like jab your pride no, and your no, worth. No. Yeah. It's like it's their job to get something done on budget. So if your budget doesn't line up to that, then like it's okay to be like, I'm sorry, this doesn't work. Yeah. And then the magic is that now that price your price is in the back of their minds. And then when they're ready, yeah, they'll come back. And that has happened to me twice. Mm-hmm. Where I said, like, no. This is it. And like two years later it came back and it was like a fair price it was like what a, a dream price really i was like oh my god um and that was just something that was so hard to learn and something i still feel like i'm learning um but something i really try to pass on to other people i think it's so important i have it, it's somewhat similar i mean even so in your example they came back up to two years later um i also think it's important to talk about um, maybe expanding a little bit on your big company <laughs> uh, comment of, you know, this year is the year that I I had a lot of people, hey, can't you just give me a break? It's been, you know, a rough time. And I can't tell you how much my personality wants to say yes to that and downcut my time and downcut, you know, my efforts because I love the restaurant industry so much, right? But there's you know, many times where I've, I've said, Oh, I just can't like in my head, I just can't go any lower. And I hold firm and it's not even two years. It's like, okay, we'll make it work. Uh, let's change the quantity from 50 to 30. Mm -hmm. Right. And having that, um, self assuredness, that self worth and that knowledge about what your practice takes on a per hour, which I really fought for a while, oh, yeah. per hour basis. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and then that design, I think the other part I want to bring up again that you said is the design time, right? And especially with ceramics, we get stuck in this, how long does it take me? I've, I can't even tell you oh, so many times I've been asked in interviews, how long can, does it take you to throw a mug? And I love the answer. I can't even remember what ceramicist. It was someone on Instagram. But, um, you know, I've been throwing for 20 years. So I'm always like 20 years and three minutes, right, to yeah. actually throw the mug. <laughs> but then it could even be another layer of, well, I went to, I get all of my clay locally from a man who makes clay mm. from base ingredients. So, well, where did that mug really start? Because I went over to Michael's warehouse and we chit chatted for a while and we figured out the clay and we got this specific clay and then I brought it here in this bag and I cut it out and I wedged it and I, you know, there was like that sleepless time from three to 5 a.m. where I thought of that new mug shape, (laughs) 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 right? Like I just, I think we sometimes underestimate all the different aspects. I mean, I'm really expanding it there, but Uh, like. But it does show you, it goes infinitely. I mean, like. Yeah. In the from sourcing materials to passing through your hands, right. you know, it's like you can you can divide it endlessly almost to you know you got you got to like pin it down at a couple yeah. different places, but but it's true the 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 understanding for yourself um, really helps you just like get, it, get it grounds you, it. and then also just like giving yourself credit, like you said, you know I. Like, you know, how much does it, how long does it take me to throw a mug? Well, I've been working on these mugs for like off and on for 20 years. The mastery, you were saying, you have to accept that you are a master and that 
there was some kind of knowledge base that came in through all of those years of trial and error yeah and passion yeah absolutely and you know and also i just think like i i compare to like other industries i'm like what would a boss in another like would the ceo of someone be like um well maybe maybe maybe, maybe, (laughs) like no like have some like yeah pride in yourself and and just like you're you're a boss like you're you got to go in and like high level people will respect people who are high level and yeah. if you go in and you know your numbers you're like this is the price for this yes you know people are going to say no or yes yeah. and um i think people of high you know high level um, mastery in their own field whether that's you know a client from yes. another industry that you're working with you know they can see that in someone they'll respect that yeah in the that, that's what i respect in other people absolutely and i know that that's just a mirror back to me too so when i i want to present myself in my mind's eye of this like <laughs> badass who's got his shit together and knows what to like do <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. so important it's so important to know what actually goes into your art the hours yeah. and breaking it down. I fought that for so long. I just wanted to be like, oh, you know, I'll just like figure out the market and like, you know, <laughs> like price it accordingly. Yeah. Well, um, I want to touch on one last thing that I feel like have kind of come up a few different times and it's something that's just like so fascinating to me. Um, you said it right at the beginning of our conversation, but there's ephemerality to ceramics Mm -hmm. and you know from your studio master smashing it in front of your (laughs) face be like try again um also to you know you creating work and then releasing it um and then also like ceramics are delicate and they break and you know it just makes me think of impermanence and you know linear time and things have a a life and um yeah i was just thinking maybe we could uh touch on some of that because i think there's something also my anthropology side it's like ceramics are like the oldest things in the world isn't it crazy so it's like there's you know i remember going through archaeology classes in college and just you know the different ceramics from around the world and what they mean and like culturally and and everything but there's just they're of the earth it's a natural material i think is so fascinating um and also just like you know i use a lot of circles and geometry in my art yeah and i just love like the wheel and the circular and just like the endless and the spin and there's Maybe I should try ceramics sometime, but I would love to uh, we'll <laughs> yeah, throw, throw a pot with you sometime. Get elbow deep in clay, yeah. Yeah. Gosh, there's so much there. I feel like, um, yes, I, we, I talked about surrender multiple times. I talk about it with, um, at any stage of the ceramic process, there is a lot of surrender because, um, you know, I mean, earlier when you were setting up your equipment, I'm like hustling because of the weather change and it's, yeah. we're in the middle of a heat, like some pretty hot weather and everything's drying really fast and it will crack if I don't get to it right away and trim it and cover it and baby it. Um, there's like surrender and like the drying. There's so many elements that are out, are out of your control. A kiln firing that might not happen the way you want, an air bubble in your clay that you just didn't catch and it blows up, right? Um, and then there's also the fact that it's funny because ceramics both last forever. I was just in New Mexico like a few years ago yeah. and found some, you know, I was on a hike and there were some ceramic shards yeah. that were incredibly old, right? But the pot itself is gone. Um, and then also, you know, so they last forever, but then there's also this, like you said, it's they're going to break, right? And I've had this conversation a couple times with chefs and it used to really stress me out a little bit, like... You know, like, you need to put felt pads between my pieces because they're a little bit precious and, like, everyone be careful. And then I hear, like, one of my, like, chefs is sort of, like, like to the wait staff, like, got to be careful. And I'm like, ah, don't make it bad. Like, it's <laughs> art. And we're going to have fun with this, right? But, um, but being comfortable in that because anything that you're designing, do you really want – think about how chefs repaint their restaurant, how chefs reimagine their menus. Like – maybe the purpose of this plate isn't to be lasting a decade, right? Maybe, you know, it's part of the the normal ebb and flow and the creation and the evolution of this restaurant in which, you know, it doesn't need to last forever. That's not its job. Um, 
so I think that's interesting to think about. And then you were talking about how the wheel, which is why um, we didn't talk about this, but you're painting a mural in, you know, we're sitting here and I just want to say for a minute about how comfortable we are with each other. Like, this is my very intimate creative space. I'm sure you feel the same way about your studio. Mm -hmm. And when I was thinking about what kind of artwork I wanted in my studio, I asked you because of the circular nature. I find that incredible, like, you know, like Arrival, like the movie Arrival oh, yeah. with the circular nature yeah. of time and the wheel and, and that you play with that geometry. Um, but for me, you've talked a lot about your spirituality. I've really been trying to sit and sort of meld into our short time on Earth and really getting comfortable with impermanence and the now, right? The past is the past. Who knows what the future will be? And like, I am in this moment right now. Um, and I don't really think it's my plate's jobs to last a decade. And, yeah. and really, you say, well, of course, but no, but like really sitting with that, right? That's mm -hmm. my art. That's like, it's an extension of my body. Like I, I put everything into my art, but being okay with that. And ceramics is really good at teaching you that. We, yeah. we Pottery people talk about this all the time. Like, you know, like we call it kilnmas when you're opening your, your kiln, it's like Christmas. Like, did it work? Even people that are like three decades in, you know, you peak earlier than you're supposed to. It's still 200 <laughs> degrees and you're just like, I'm just going to check, you know, because every part of the process is fraught with impermanence and things not working out. And I think that's a really good space to be. Yeah. Yeah. There's... We could There's just so have a whole there. other podcast yeah. on all of this. Did I miss anything? There's yeah. so like so many parts to that. Um, no, I mean the. How do you feel about your murals? Do you do you see them in an impermanent way that they will be painted over? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what I was um, thinking as you were talking. You know, like I came from the world of like street art, which was much more you know, no. It is no, in the now. Uh, yeah, yeah. it's like no permission style. You yeah. know, skirting the legal uh, system. <laughs> And there, it's just, that is a part of it. Like, you don't know if a piece is going to run one night, one week, or one year. So yeah. just, you're putting it up, and it's just constantly in flux, you know? And that's something I'm, I'm understanding now at this point in my life is that there is never one, like, stable moment. Everything is in process at all times, whether that's, like you were saying, the interior of a restaurant where yeah. your plates are there, there's certain napkins, tableware, there's uh, artwork on the wall, you know, there's different kinds of food. Everything's just like, that's just what's yeah. interesting with culture is things just are in flux all the time in process. Yeah. And so artwork for me is this interesting way to kind of just like put a timestamp on the chapters. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's some public artwork like large scale sculpture that, you know, bronze sculpture will last a really 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 long time hundreds of years but then there's wood sculpture that will not mm -hmm. um and so you know it and it makes you think also just like making stuff in a studio and then it leaving your studio it's now gone it's and gone. so it's out in the world um uh, i definitely in my earlier career had a, almost a hard time just like letting stuff go mm -hmm. you know because i really like something i made I'm like i want to look at that but it's also just like kind of kept pinning me to like this time and place where it's like that needs to leave because it's it's like a shift of energy it's like that's literally taking up space yes. physical space and mental space and like energetic space in my studio and like vortex but when that leaves then there's room for new yeah and so it's like then the progression and the experimentation can continue but not if i'm just surrounding myself with my own art and so that just takes a little time. It took me a little time to be comfortable with things leaving. Um, and now just like loving that part because that means time for the next, what's new. And isn't that the surrender of life? Like you and yeah. I will die so that our kids can have their children and it will go on. And that is the point, right? Yeah. And that is making space for the new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think we can Put a timestamp on this. Yeah, and, we can. Um, <laughs> there, we can probably save a lot for a round two at some point down the road. I'd but love that. Um, 
Aaron, thank you so much. Um, I'd love to take a moment and um, honor you and what you do. You are someone that has chosen to follow their path and their their interests and their passion and their curiosities and pursue that with every ounce that you have within yourself and that is a mighty task and most people do not do that so I want to honor you for doing that and putting your work out there because whoever is looking at the bottom side of your plate at a restaurant might be having those questions for themselves right now and hopefully this can get shared and can inspire some other people to uh, do whatever they do, ask more questions, make some stuff, and uh, continue their path. So thank you for this time and this conversation and inviting me into your space. And we didn't talk about it till the end, but yeah, I'm painting you a mural. So I'm uh, very honored to bring some of my art to hopefully uh, uh, give you some some real tranquility and peace and calm and joy um, in one of your most sacred spaces. So I look forward to finishing this mural and um, <laughs> I'll share it down the road when it's all done. But thank you so much for your time. And um, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, where is the best place for people to find you? Um, you know, it, on Instagram, I'm Aaron Hup Ceramics, Aaron underscore Hup underscore Ceramics. Um, I have a website, Aaron Hup Ceramics. And I think email is the best. Yeah. So Aaron at AaronHupCeramics.com. And the final thing I want to say for that person flipping the plate over at the restaurant, come on up. There's a lot of room. It's not a zero-sum game. Let's, yeah. let's hang out. Follow your passions. Think about your, your inner voice and your perspective. And it's pretty great here. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you beautiful. for the time. Okay, everyone, see you later. Bye. All right, everybody. I hope you had as much fun as I did with that conversation with the wonderful and talented Erin Hupp. Be sure to send Erin some love, follow her on social media, and also check out her website. I have links in the description. Also, if you want to stay up to date with my podcast, art projects, and all things in my world, my newsletter is the best place for that. So if you head to my website, striderpatent.com, and click on newsletter, you can sign up there so you'll be the first to know about all things coming through my world. All right, see you next time.